Amen. Okay, keep your place, of course, in Romans 3. That will be our main text for tonight. So as you know, we've been going through the book of Romans in the last few weeks, and we are now in Romans chapter 3. So we have been going, we started in Romans chapter 1, Romans just to recap, um, Romans 1 and 2, because Romans 3 just, cu- just keeps right into the story, okay? So Romans chapter 1, uh, Paul was talking about the Gentiles and how they're, you know, they're without excuse before God, even though they didn't have the law, you know, the law um, in their hearts, their conscience in their heart was a law unto itself, so they're still guilty, they're still guilty. And then, of course, in Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about, you know, the Jews and how, you know, the Jews, they had the law, but it was, you know, the circumcision really, they were called Jews, but the circumcision is really a circumcision of the heart, of the spirit. So it's those who are saved. You know, he starts, he introduced this theory um, in chapter 2 about how circumcision isn't of the flesh, okay? And in Romans chapter 3 and verse 1, he continues this thought, And he says in verse 1, he says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Because if you look back in the verse, the two verses before Romans chapter 3, he says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. Because you had the Jews who were just getting praise of men. They were outwardly um, righteous on the outside to show people that they were righteous. But he's saying the circumcision was of the heart. And in Romans chapter 3, he just continues this thought in verse 1. He says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of of circumcision? It's a good question, right? So what advantage do the Jews have? If, if they're still you know, under God's judgment, if they're still under the law, what advantage do they have? And then he answers the question in verse number 2, and he says, much every way. He says there's many advantages. Chiefly, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So they had many advantages, and the advantages stemmed from the fact that they had the Bible, the Jews. The Jews had the Word of God. And that is a serious advantage. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. Let's look at this concept of the Bible being an advantage in your life as it was an advantage to the Jews. I'll read for you Hebrews 4 and verse 12 while you're turning there. And the Bible says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17 says this, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. The Bible, the word of God is our weapon. The, the word of God tells us. It's our weapon. In John 6, turn look at verse 63. Verse 63. You know, this is the weapon when Jesus said, "Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel." This is the weapon that we were to take with us, the weapon of the Word of God. And when we go out preaching the gospel, it is our sword that we take with us. In John 6, 63, the Bible says, It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The Word of God is our life, folks. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, so faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It is only by the Word of God that we are saved. And we need to remember that when we're out soul winning and we're we're getting better and better at giving the gospel to people and becoming personable with people and and reading people and, and, you know, just being friendly with people and being a people person will make you a better soul winner, but you you need to never forget that it is the Word of God that saves people when we are out there. It's, you know, we say, oh, I got this many people saved, this many. The Word of God got people saved, not, not us. Okay, that's, we need to remember that when we're preaching the gospel because you will find people that will go out and they will give the gospel and they will tell all kinds of stories and analogies and all kinds of things. And I mean, I've been out soul winning with some people who, that's why, I, that's why by the way, that I'm just like, we in general need to stick to 
the soul winning seminar of Verity Baptist Church when we go soul winning. Because it can get really strange. I've been soul winning with people where you, you hear a gospel presentation and you're just like, I think I just lost my salvation. I don't know what that was all about. You know, I'm joking, but I mean, it's just like you don't even understand. If I, a saved person, can't understand what you're saying, the gospel's simple, right? The gospel is simple. It's designed that way. It wouldn't have been fair if God made the gospel so complicated that only the, the most elite, smartest people could get it, right? So the gospel's simple. Let's keep it simple. Right? And yes, there's many things that you can do and better things that you can get at at expounding the Word of God. We need to remember that it's the Word of God that saves people. That was the advantage the Jews had. It's the advantage we have. Okay? And it's a huge advantage. I forgot the book tonight, but I was going to bring this book that we had in our house, and we have in our house. And I remember this book. It was written in, the, in like the 1600s. It's a great little book. And it's, it's about the testimony of this kid's life. He lives in, like, England, and he's given this testimony of his life, and, and kind of, it's a neat little story. It's called The Hedge of Thorns. But there's a part in the beginning of the book where he's talking about his dad and how his teacher used to it, you make them memorize Scripture because nobody actually had a Bible because it was just such a, it was an elite thing to have a Bible. And he talked about how he'll never forget the day his dad sold one of the two cows... This is a true story from the 1600s. His dad sold one of their two cows to buy a copy of the scriptures. So imagine, I mean, just imagine that for a minute. Imagine having to spend half of your business or half of your net worth or half of your income to, to purchase a Bible. I went and looked it up, you know, a few days ago. You can buy a Bible for like $3. You know, on Amazon, the average price is like $10 for a nice King James Bible. It's extremely available, and for that reason, I think we take it for granted. You know, I think we take it for granted. You know, just when you imagine how many people throughout history have just not had this advantage that we have, okay? Now, this is a powerful advantage as well, and we can share it with others. Turn to John chapter 8. Now, I believe that, and this is a, a theory of mine as well, but I believe that one of the reasons for all these different Bible versions in the last hundred years or so is because the Bible, the King James Bible, has become so available to people. So the devil has to attack this. He must come at it in a way that, that undoes this fact because everybody can have a King James Bible today. If you look down at John chapter 8 and verse 44... We can read about um, the devil, and Jesus says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of, speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In 2 Corinthians 11, 14, the Bible says, and no, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. You see, Satan has never operated in the way where he just comes out and he says, look, here's a book, I'm Satan, I rebelled against God, here's my ideas, and I think they're better than God's. See, he's not trying to come up with his own ideas and his own theories and his own philosophies. He's taking what God, this is what he's always done. He's still doing it today. We'll talk about liberal Christianity in a couple weeks, and you'll see he's really doing it very well today. And he takes what God does, and he twists it just a little bit. And, he, and the thing about these false Bible versions, I love New World Order Bible versions. I love, it was one of my favorite documentaries even before I moved to California. I love it. But here's the thing. I love studying all the details about the things that have changed, and I love studying about how there's an agenda to, you know, take away the deity of Christ, and there's an agenda to, you know, twist certain things in the Bible that, that really attack key doctrines. But here's the thing. It doesn't really matter. Because the fact that all these Bible versions exist is enough. Because it's not like you're going to find somebody out there. I'll, let me explain what I'm saying here, if you're not with me. You're not going to find many people out there, or I've never found anybody that's like, I believe the NIV, but not the King James. You see, what happens is there's so many Bibles that are just flooded out there, 100, 150, they've just created doubt of the Word of God. So 
most people, unless you're saved and have studied it out, most people, they don't know all the different things that have been changed in all these different Bible versions. But they're like, just the fact that these Bible versions exist makes them doubt the Word of God. I've met several people like that. Many, many people. And if you go soul winning enough, you will meet these people as well. They just, you know, they doubt the Word of God. They doubt the Word of God. And you say, well, we, we, we only use the King James. It doesn't even really mean anything to them. Because they're just, they've been grown up with so many different Bible versions, they're just confused about it all. You see, so it's, it's a very successful tactic. And it, he didn't even really have to change any specific details. All he had to do was show people that it, it must have needed to be changed. And people all of a sudden, because guess what? If there's one mistake in here, if there's one mistake in here, how, how do I know where it is? I had a, I had a, a power plant a couple of years ago, and we found out that 10% of the power plant was rewired, was wired wrong when we were building this power plant. And the contractor and the owner, they were arguing if it was 10% or it was 50%. And I was the guy coming in to fix it. And I said, forget about it. It doesn't matter if it's 10% or 90%. Unless you can tell me which 10% is wrong, I got to check everything. And that's the same thing with the Bible. If there's one mistake in here, and I don't know where it is, I doubt everything. But there is no mistake in here. But when you throw out all these different versions, it creates doubt in people's mind. And if people think that maybe it's 5% wrong, or it's 10% wrong, it doesn't matter. Because then they doubt the whole book. You see? So it's a brilliant plan. He's always been a liar. And he's always been transforming into an angel of light. He's always been trying to pass off his ideas as God's ideas. He's never come up with his own ideas. He just wants to take as many people. He knows he's going to hell. He knows he is damned, and he wants to take as many people with him as possible. And, and he's, he's succeeding, unfortunately, in, in many ways. Okay. Verse number three. We're gonna, that, that was a long two verses. We'll, we'll go through these a little bit faster. In verse number three, so the Bible says, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Still talking about the Jews. He's saying, what if they did not believe? All right. They had the advantage of the Bible. What other advantage do they have? He said, what if they did not believe, or some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Meaning, can, do they have the advantage where they don't even have to believe? And look what he says. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Look, he's saying that the Jew doesn't have that advantage. If the Jew doesn't believe... He's just as damned as somebody else that doesn't believe. Amen. The only advantage that the Jew had was that he had the oracles of God committed to him, which is a huge advantage. I actually asked this question to a Baptist pastor several years ago before we moved as well, who was, you know, the Jews are God's chosen people, all this kind of stuff. And I, and I was just like, okay, fine. You know, I, I didn't really know about any, any of the end times prophecy stuff, but I was confused logically about it. If somebody died without believing in Christ, I knew they were going to hell. And so I asked uh, this pastor, I said, if, if somebody dies, if a Jew dies and does not believe in Jesus Christ, where are they going? And he said, well, hell. I'm like, what advantage? What advantage is there? That's the question that they can't answer. There is no advantage other than that they were committed to oracles of God. And then Jesus came and they didn't believe him. So they lost that advantage as well. All right, verse number five. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. Now, I love um, when Paul does this type of thing. You see this, I speak as a man. This, to me, proves that Paul knows he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because he asks a question here. He asks a question, and it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek question. And he wants to clarify that the Holy Spirit would obviously know the answer to this question. And he says, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? Because obviously God is not unrighteous who taketh vengeance. Because God is holy. God is holy. Now, turn to um, Psalm 103. And I'll read for you 1 Samuel 2, verses 2. In 1 Samuel 2, verses 2, when we see that God is holy, this is another thing that we need to explain to people when we're out soul winning. Because this is a huge problem in America today. People have the wrong view of God. 
You are going to meet people who may have grown up in a Christian home. Uh, we met some people like this this weekend. It's almost better to find somebody who's unchurched, I, I say these days. Because people have a false God, a false idea of God in their head. God is holy, and He must judge sin. That's what the Bible is saying here. He has to. In 1 Samuel 2.2, 2, the Bible says, There is none, hol none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any like is there any rock like our God? In Psalm 103, verse 1, a psalm of David, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now, turn to Romans 12. That means whatever God does is right. So when people think that, oh, that sounds mean, uh, a mean God would never throw anyone into hell, God is holy. God is judgment. The Bible tells us this. We may not understand this today, but you know what? It's okay to not understand everything, by the way. You know, people get themselves into trouble when they think that every single deep thing of the mind of God, they have to understand. That's where you see all these people getting into these weirdo doctrines on the Trinity and all this kind of stuff. Hey, when the Bible says, you know, it's three persons in one, it's three in one, I, I, I'm good. I'll ask God about it when I get to heaven. Hey, how exactly does that work? How do those gears fit together? It's when you start coming up with analogies on your own and you try to fit it into your own human logic and those types of things. Look, the gospel's simple. How to get to heaven is simple. We can understand that. But there's some deep things in this book. We don't have to be so arrogant to think that we will just understand everything all the time. Okay? So look, just remember, whatever God does is right. God is holy. In Romans uh, verse 12, we see that God, you know, the, Paul said at the end of verse 5, is God, unrighteous, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God will take vengeance. In Romans 12, verse 19, we see this. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. God will punish sin. And those who are not saved are going to be punished in hell. And that's another thing that you're going to find that many people don't believe when you're out soul winning. This is a good soul winning lesson, Romans chapter 3. Because really, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 2, and Romans chapter 3, Paul is just given this huge soul winning lesson is what he's doing. Okay? God will punish sin, and those that don't believe will be punished in hell. Turn to Luke 16. Let's look at that. You ever, if you go soul winning enough, you're going to, you're going to find this guy too. You're going to find this guy. The guy that you say, you know, you get to the hell verses, and the guy is going to be like, man, hell's right, hell's right now, man. This is hell, man. Right here, bro. We're living in hell, dude. You, I mean, you guys, you guys are laughing because you've met this guy. We've all met this guy. You know, and I feel bad for that guy. Because obviously things are not going great for you. If you think like, man, bro, this is hell, bro. Dude, bro. I had a conversation with Garrett one time for like 10 minutes and all we could say was dude and bro. And we did it. No, but seriously, you're going to find this guy. Okay? You're going to find this guy. Now let's look at this story in Luke chapter 16, verse 19. We're going to start reading. We're going to read the whole thing. Because I want to explain some things about hell. And you can take people to these verses to explain hell. Because it's important, it's scary, and it should be scary. Okay? Look, Luke 16, verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple, purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Immediately he was in hell. You see that? That's the first thing. There's none of this, you sleep, and then whenever else, you know, you, you wake up later. He, he, immediately he lift up his eyes, and he was, being, he was in torments right away. And seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. He's burning. He's burning, and he just wants to be cooled off. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus 
evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Look, there's no getting out. So to that guy that says that to you, you need to say, you know what, man? Are you on fire right now? Are you in flames, burning, in pain right now? No, you're not. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. He knows he can't get out, but he wants his family to, to not go there. Okay? Now look, there's these other people that are like, oh, I'm just going to go to hell because that's where all my friends are going to be. Your friends don't want you there. If your friends are in hell, they're there for about a millisecond before they realized that they wanted you to not go there. This guy immediately, he knows he can't get out. And he immediately just wants someone to go tell his family. Someone, get back there, tell my family. I have five brethren, he said, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. They have this. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Belief, folks, is a heart issue. It's a heart issue. I used to be one of these people that was like, you know what? If we could just find, um, you know, before I was saved, I was like, if we could just find Noah's Ark and we could just find all this stuff, everyone would believe in God. No. Jesus did miracles in front of the Pharisees, and they still didn't believe. And then eventually they could not believe. It's a heart issue. Their heart is hard. So even though somebody came back from the dead, Abraham says to him, they're not going to believe anyway. Because he didn't believe the Bible. His heart's not right. He wouldn't believe anyway. So, Revelation 14. Let's look at one more thing on hell. And if this is hell. Revelation 14 and verse 11, the Bible says this, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever re receiveth the mark of his name. Talking about people that are damned to hell. There's no rest, and it's forever. It never ends. Imagine, I mean, you can't even wrap your head around it. You can't even wrap your head, head around it. Imagine no rest. Imagine that. You know, people torture people that way. You know, that's like a psychological form of torture. I, I got a quote here from psychological, Psychology Today. Sleep deprivation is an especially insidious form of torture because it attacks the deep biological functions at the core of a person's mental and physical health. It is less overtly violent than cutting off someone's finger, but it can be far more damaging and painful if pushed to extremes. Now imagine the extremes of never having any rest and burning while you never have any rest. This is not hell. <laughs> no matter how bad your bill situation is or whatever, you have a fundamental misunderstanding of the vengeance of God if you think that this could even be close to hell. So feel free to have a couple verses that can explain this to people from the Bible if you get that, if you run across that, that guy. You know, God is a perfect judge, folks, and he will take vengeance. So the answer to Paul's, you know, question is, is God unrighteous that taketh vengeance? No, you know, God is righteous. God is the perfect judge. And everything that he does is right. Look at verse number 7. Romans, chapter 3, verse number 7. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. This is chapters 1 and 2 right here. Both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. This wraps up chapters 1 and 2. I love how he just repeats these things. and he, he goes into these long essays about the Gentiles and these long essays about the Jews, and then he just repeats it for us again and wraps it up right here. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. 
They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Then he goes into, you know, verses 13 through 18. He talks about how, you know, their throat is an open sepulchre. You know, their feet are, you know, he's kind of recapping um, some of the uh, Romans chapter 1. And if we go down to uh, verse number 19, we can continue there. The Bible says, Now we know that what's, what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth be stopped, and all the world become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. He says it again. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So that's the point of the law, is, the, is to give us the knowledge of sin before we are saved. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all that upon them that believe. For there is no difference, just repeating this, between Jew and Gentile. It's faith in Jesus Christ, Jew or Gentile. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's the second time he says it. You know, the Bible repeats many important things two or three times. You know, he says, not of works. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, he, he repeats there as well. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. He says it twice, just to make sure we don't get it, or we don't miss it. And then in verse number 25, whom being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Propitiation means appeasement or atonement, appeasing God's wrath towards you. God's wrath towards sin. Now, imagine if Paul is just wrapping everything up in verses 26, 27, and 28. Imagine she was just, he just gave this awesome essay on chapter 1 and chapter 2, and then he gets up with his microphone, and he says, To declare, I say at the beginning, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him, that's you, which believeth in Jesus, where is boasting then? Sounds a lot like Ephesians 2. Where is boasting then? Is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Do we get it? Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Mic drop. That's it. Right there. The mic doesn't work anyway. That's the whole thing. That's all of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Right there. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Not with a little bit of the deeds of the law, not with some of the deeds of the law, without the deeds of the law. That's it. Lest any man should boast. It sounds a lot like Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. It's because it's the same Holy Spirit that wrote it. That's why. And then down in verse number 29, we see this. Is he the God of the Jews only? And then he just goes in and just kind of beats down this this Jew and Gentile thing a little bit more. I mean, how you could be unclear about the book of Romans and you could pull works out of the book of Romans is shocking to me. Truly, it is. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. So there's the Jews and the Gentiles. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. Now, throughout Romans, we're going to learn a lot more about the law. Okay? Because our salvation is not through the law. It's not through our obedience to the law. It's not through our works. We know that, right? So what is the point of the law? And he's really going to get deep into some of that stuff in, in some later chapters. But we can talk a little bit about it now. First of all, the law is there to convict us before we are saved. It's there to show us our sin. And then after we are saved, the law is there to establish us. So we're convicted by it, and then we're established by it. Now, when I became a Baptist... 
many years ago. I used to be a Lutheran. I got saved. I got into a Baptist church. Many people thought, and I even thought this myself about Baptists. So I can see both sides of this. I can remember both sides of this. But many people thought that we were under some legalistic system when we became Baptist. Because people saw changes in us. And I always wondered that about the Baptist. Because I, I would argue eternal security 15 years ago with a coworker of mine, and I was Lutheran, and he was Baptist, and we would argue eternal security, and we never agreed. But I, little did I know, he thought I was unsaved. He never told me that. Thanks a lot, buddy. But what I always thought about the Baptist was it's really strange that they believe that they could never do anything to lose their salvation, yet they're like, they, their, their wives are dressing modestly. They, they go out sharing the gospel with people. And I always knew that that was something that we should be doing. Always. Even before I was saved. Because that's one of the simple things in the Bible. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. That's not rocket surgery. You know what I'm saying? Amen. I mean, you don't have to be saved to understand that one. And, but I was always wondering. So he, he doesn't think that he can do anything to lose his salvation, yet they're he doesn't drink, he doesn't do these things, and he's living a clearly different life than everybody else. Yet, I grew up, you know, in a Lutheran home, and I know many Catholics who are just drunks, and they believe in works. It doesn't make any sense. There's a definite inversion of logic there. If they believe in works, they should be living the, their best life now, right? As we talked about a week ago. But here's the thing, folks. What you're going to learn in Romans as we go forward, and what you're going to learn as you grow as a Christian if you don't already know it, is that the law is freedom. The law is freedom. Sin is slavery. And you're going to learn that. And the more you, you learn the Bible, and the more you get, you get plugged into the Christian life, and the more you start walking in the Spirit instead of the flesh, you're going to understand that sin, all these things the world tells you, is freedom, is slavery. That's what you're going to learn. So the law drives us to the gospel. And we get saved, and it establishes us in our life. Okay? And Paul's going to get very deep into all those things in the, next, in the coming chapters. So all the... You know, the, the drinking, the music, the TV, the, the, the dressing um, provocatively, all that stuff is slavery. You'll, you'll see it clear as day. And the more you start living the right life, you're going to see that as well. And it's a wonderful thing because, I mean, people look at me now as that, I used to say that about uh, my, my friend Lance. I used to say it all the time. Great guy. No fun. I, I used to say that. I'm embarrassed to say it. But I used to say that about the guy. But the thing is, people look at me and they, people, worldly people will look at me and think the same thing. Like, we're just no fun. But I've never had more fun in my life than I'm having right now. And that is the truth. Because of the law and walking in the law, walking in the spirit instead of the flesh it is just, is mind-blowingly free, folks. All right? Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, these chapters in the Bible. Um, we thank you for the Apostle Paul that you used him to, to write such, such great, uh, great essays and explanations on, on the gospel. Lord, we ask you that um, just give us, give us this clarity that Paul has when we go out and we preach the gospel. Just help us be as clear as possible using your word, Lord, knowing that it's your word that has power using your word for whatever anyone comes at us with or has questions about, that we may be able to give them a clear understanding and a clear explanation from your word, Lord. And, and hopefully that their heart is right and that they will end up you know, accepting Christ. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this church. Um, thank you for all of these people that would come out on a Thursday night to hear, hear your word preached. Um, bless the rest of our evening and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name.